The Evanrad Snowboard Podcast is presented by Vans. Season 7 of Evanrad is sponsored by Wired Snowboards, the Boardroom Snowboard Shop, and on Optics, Time Bomb Trading, the Canadian distributor of Stance, Dragon, 32, and much more, and Tribute Board Shop in Nelson, B.C. Time Bomb Trading distributes 32 up in Canada, and the new Spring Break Powder Bib Pant ignites a new era of high-performance collaboration. Designed to the exact specifications of Corey Smith, 32 set out to build the perfect deep pal bib. Featuring their Pinnacle 32 Repel 20K Dura Stretch Fabric, their exclusive Reactor Mesh Thermo Responsive Lining, Dual Hip Venting, and Full Front Zip Design, the Spring Break Powder Bib blends timeless style with critical white room performance. 32's not messing around with these bibs. All critical seams are triple stitched and the style is on point. Check the Spring Break Powder Bib at your local 32 dealer or at 32.com. Support also comes from Grouse Mountain, Mount Seymour, New Green Superfood Drink, Volcom Outerwear, Intuition Liners, and GoPro. Thanks to everyone who supports the show. Trent Bush has deeper roots in snowboarding than pretty much anyone. Along with his brother Troy, Trent has designed clothing in almost every era of snowboarding. They started Twist Clothing together just out of high school, and it was a game changer. Then he and his brother went on to design outerwear for Burton. We're talking analog and Ronin era Burton designing. Then it was section outerwear with Mark Frank Montoya. Tech 9, Sound, and Nomis were all at one time brands that Trent had his hand in running. And currently, he's the founder and co CEO of Artelect, a new first layer and outerwear brand that's headquartered out of Boulder, Colorado. It wasn't just sort of metaphorically a middle ground, it literally was a middle ground. (laughs) So, you know, the worlds, of course, and the contests, and all the way through the King of the Mountain contests, all the early contests, it was the East Coast and the the West Coast and Northwest and Tahoe and Utah and, you know, everybody literally coming together in the same place. And and some of the people coming over from overseas at the time. Yeah. It was, you know, those those early contests, the Worlds in, in particular, was exactly where you would, for the first time, see what everybody had been working on mm. for an entire year. Mm. And everybody would come with their new equipment. There was no internet. Right. There were no magazines. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. literally. I mean, there was ISM, but it was where people would bring out their latest stuff, where people would show the new tricks, where it was it right. was a really like honestly kind of magical time. Yeah. Like, thinking back on it, yeah. Talking with Kevin Kinnear about the '86 Worlds, I got a feel for what it was like to be someone trying to start a magazine there that doesn't know how to dress yeah. and is walking through the s- snow under the lift, like hoping people aren't going to throw snowballs at them and not knowing how to snowboard at all. But what was it like for somebody w- that was s- into snowboarding? It was the same thing because it was the, not only would you see the equipment and the stuff, you would see the people, of course, right? And for me, working in a snowboard shop at that point, one of the earliest, you know, at Wave Rave in Boulder, which then spun out to be, you know, a tangent, the current Wave Rave and all of that was a tangent, but the original was in was in Boulder in Colorado. A lot of the people, again, your little Boulder Posse you've been interviewing yeah. of Dowd and Pappas Brothers and Delaney's and uh, Tim Wendell and all these guys came out of that that era and that wave. But those, you know, so I, I was around those guys all the time because they were on the Wave Rave team, but going to the Worlds, you know, meeting Kidwell, I mean, for me, that was insane. Meeting Palmer, <laughs> right? Meeting Damien. Um, I, the, you the Burt Lamar's of the world, Craig Kelly's of the world. I mean, everybody was there. And there was a, I mean, of course there was competitiveness and all that, but there was also just this, it it was kids having fun sort of mentality. Yeah. It was just, it was, I mean, there were snowball fights. Yeah. I've got incredible footage I took, I think at the 87 (laughs) worlds of, you know, Tim Wendell being uh, interviewed uh, by Brett from Wave Rave and a snowball hits him in the face and you look over <laughs> and it's like, I don't even remember who it was that threw the snowball, but it was like, you know, 
That's it was like amazing. Craig Keller. So it was like it was hilarious. Totally. And, and so, but it was there was just like a really a really cool spirit. And that's actually I, the story I didn't tell you was the 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 minute I decided that I was actually going to be in the snowboard industry or that that was going to be my life and my career. Yeah. Um, it was at the 87 Worlds. And I'd gone up with Wave Rave with Brett Conrad, who owned Wave Rave. And we had rented a, a um, condo. And the night before the contest, and this is, I mean, these weren't, I mean, yeah, maybe they were athletes, but they were snowboarders, <laughs> right? Yeah. And we're, yeah. we had a party in the condo. And I was 16, I think. Oh, wow. And uh, I may have been 15. I don't, I don't know. Exa- no, 16 I was. Um, and <laughs> there's Damien. There's the whole Wave Rave team. There's um, Palmer. Everybody's drinking this whole thing. And I'm just like sitting in this room. And I remember distinctly looking around the room and looking at all of my heroes, like literally all of them. And I'm wow. like, and I'm like this 16 year old kid. I'm like, you can do this. <laughs> like you can actually live like this and have this much fun. And everybody's having like just this amazing time. So we go next day, I go to the contest, you know, the contest happens or whatever. We come back and all of our gear, everything's on the, on the patio or on the, the deck. <laughs> and we had gotten kicked out of this condo for having this party. Yeah. And I'm like, and I was, my mind was just blown. I'm like, this is it. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> and I've done it ever since, literally ever since. Uh, it's amazing. In one way or another. Yeah. So what? At, at 16 years old, uh, how far off from starting your first company are you? Did you have a short stint as like a, or a long stint as like a pro rider that was getting shots and going in contests and placing and doing all that stuff? No, I didn't. You know, I was, I wanted to be. And yeah. that was sort of the other sort of divergent point in my life because I really, really wanted to be. Yeah. Um, I was just too young to be part of that first wave yep. uh, of riders. Yep. And then, I mean, I guess I wasn't just too old for the other side, but at that point I had already been working working at Wave Rave, doing all that, and I, I, I just needed to go that direction and kind of into the industry side. And I was still really riding a lot, and I still ride uh, as much as I possibly can, but back yeah. then... I was, but I just, I, you know, I don't think I had the talent. Right. Like some people you. have it and some people don't. Well, I thought I had it and I didn't. So like that's, <laughs> the, there's the, well, knowing there were, there were don't. days I thought I had it. <laughs> yeah. There's still days I think knowing, I have it. Knowing you don't is yeah. good. Yeah. There's me too. <laughs> I, I don't know when it dissolved, but it's very Only recently. Only when the snow is deep. Very recently well, it dissolved that yeah. I'm not going to do a, a pro part. Yeah. yeah. There, you know, there was one person actually, so Adam Merriman. Yeah. So again, local Boulder kid. Yeah. Um, and he was, I think he's either a year or two years younger than me. And I remember going up to Eldora. We used to go and dig the pipe and do like do the whole thing. We used to skip school in high school and go do that. And I just remember being up there thinking I was like actually pretty good. Yeah. And then little Adam Merriman who's like the stringy little kid yeah. like literally a little kid he was probably 14 yeah just just smokes any idea of me being good and I'm just <laughs> like okay well probably not so then I started working you know, on the wave rave apparel line and all that stuff when that started that's very early it's super yeah. early yeah. yeah and and so then I kind of went that way and so to answer the question I was probably I mean we started so wave rave Oh, 80, 86, 87, 88. So we started Twist, which was our first, my brother and myself and a, and a friend, Amani, who also worked at Wave Rave. Um, we started that in 89. That's so early. Yeah, in high school. Yeah, that's so early. Yeah, using all the roll ends of all the Wave Rave. Um, that's how you made it. Yeah, we made it. We actually stitched it in down. Well, my mom made our first samples um, <laughs> in, in the, the basement. Yeah, totally. That's but then, so awesome. But there used to be a pretty thriving sewing industry in Colorado because yeah. so much ski wear and things were made here. And we, we actually made fleece hoodies and that stuff downtown Boulder just behind the grocery store. There was a, sew, a sewing place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So would you redesign a hoodie? I talked about this with Kier and Ernie that you know, design, I'm like, oh, you guys designed the headphones, you know, for Kier? And yeah. Kier goes, yeah, we designed them. 
you know, the way you design in snowboarding, which is you go to a store, you buy your favorite <laughs> headphones, you give them to somebody and say, make me these that look a little different. Yeah, yeah, totally. You, so did you guys do some design with, with the early cut and sew pieces that were, were you know, where you're like, we're going to improve on what's what's here. We're going to make something that we like better than, you know, the Wave yeah. Rave Clown Pounce or whatever was going on. Well, that was Ra- the whole Wave thing. Rave yeah, I mean, the, when it wasn't just Wave Rave. It, I mean, it was everywhere. It was yeah. the entire industry. Was, Crimbola Man. It, w- it was all. West and Beach. It just wasn't what yeah. we what we wanted. I mean, my brother and I and, and Imani and, the, you know, the uh, the guys that started Twist, we we were skateboarders. Yeah. You know, 100%. Yeah, and we weren't really half pipe skaters. We were street skaters, right? And so that was the the whole drive was okay. We want to be skateboarding on snow. We're not surfers um, because we live in Colorado. Like we're just we're not surfers, right? Right. right. Um, we had half pipes and all that stuff, but I that just wasn't our thing. Um, so we were on this whole sort of next, you know, the the new thing, which was street skating and like, you know, ollieing up curbs, which was new at the time. Like, believe it or not, like, I mean, it was. Yeah, no, I understand. <laughs> I so, was there, man. Yeah, no, you there. were there. Yeah. yeah. And so it was like, the, it, everything was changing so fast and everything was so new. And we we just weren't, if you know, when you talk to, again, that, that generation ahead, we were talking about this earlier, you know, 70s style skating. There were all kinds of things or, or half pipe or all of that was was a thing and then there was there was a real divergence of m- the mentality of street skating and totally. the music that went around it and the, the art and the culture right. and the clothing because if you thing. remember clothing at, at like go go watch a, a bones brigade yeah. a, a video right they're in that california kind of you know like surf trunks and totally. and vans yeah. and you know, Christian has always got 16 T-shirts tied around <laughs> Tied them. around everything, but, yeah. But those T-shirts are like neon, and they're like surfy. Totally. They're, they're not like black T-shirts. He's not like, you know, wearing a Misfits shirt or yeah, something. No, for sure. Which is more like his his style but so if christian hasoy is in a bunch of neon stuff tied all around him and 10 swatches on his arm yeah you know that there's gonna have to be a change for street skating to be street skating yeah and the first thing you do is you take off all 10 of those watches <laughs> and then you make your pants like you, you, you cut two pairs of pants and make one yeah exactly no exactly <laughs> and yeah. get a fireman jacket like that's, riding a fucking fireman coat or that's, whatever that's totally yeah. it yeah. And, and so it was all driven out of out of that and yeah. out of the music, you know, the music thing particularly. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, punk rock and like all the things that were really happening. You mm-hmm. know, we had so Jello Biafra from Dead Kennedys is from Boulder. Whoa, wow! And so there was a. It's kind. Of, it's kind of weird. Like we were talking about, like the how much skate actually came out of Boulder with Kryptonics there and, and wallboards and all those. Early I needed that. I needed that piece. I needed yeah, that totally. Kryptonics piece because otherwise it just happened in a fishbowl. It, it didn't they, make they sense. Make no, no. Yeah. And so Kryptonics started because they were making mining. They made mining wheels. Oh. And so they found out how to make urethane for mining carts. Oh. And so then it just became a skate. Yeah, that's. And that, then it's like a hub of the wheel. Then, like anybody totally. that's in skateboarding that is on Kryptonics is going to come to the factory. They're going to work on things and they're, and they're going to see there's a scene here. Yeah. Because kids have access to the and best wheels And we would dumpster dive. Yeah. And take it, the until seconds. they started locking the dumpster. <laughs> and then the kid in my neighborhood had a, um, his dad worked at Kryptonics, so he opened his bedroom into a, a Kryptonics skate shop. That's perfect. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah. So anyway, the point being for us, it was it was just all about what was changing, what was happening at the time. Music, you know, skateboarding again, skate culture, all that stuff was just, that's who we were. And so in, in Boulder in particular, um, as soon as, it became, you know, the first snow back before they used chemicals. They'd put sand on the streets, on the roads. Yeah. So y- there was a six month period of time where th- all of the streets and all the roads were covered in sand. Mm. So you literally couldn't skateboard. Yeah. Um, but we just wanted to. <laughs> and so then snowboarding, I mean, we started snowboarding super early in the whole thing, but there was that period, especially the late eighties, early nineties. Um, other guys, Tarquin Robbins, local one of our really good friends yeah um there were just there was this just this surge of people who all had the same mentality mm-hmm. people are coming from the midwest you know dale rayberg and 
Rowan Rogers and and Nate Cole and and that whole crew, of course. Yeah. Um, there were people coming from the West Coast or people coming from the East Coast converging in Summit County. So again, uh, the next generation of that convergence yes. of people com- coming from all over the place because they had seen Breckenridge on TV. Totally. <laughs> you yeah. know? A lot of people moved here to ride that half pipe and then it wasn't here. And it wasn't here. But <laughs> but but what was here was stacks of snow, the, the early season whales, like all these things that you would, where people who really wanted that skate Jibbing. Sort of yeah. mentality yeah, and like yeah, the, the stumps and the shit whole, that whole, came out oh, of all here. of that oh my god that all yeah. came out of here and big and pants and big p- pants and yeah. wide stands and yeah. cutting down boards and yeah. and all that that was very uniquely driven out of summit county interesting and then it kind of found its way everywhere everywhere right. else right but there was one season in particular where everybody cut down their boards yep a lot of us took our high backs off yes you, you know <laughs> yep. and and t bolted our boards because stances were super to get narrow. 27 inch stances. I, yeah. The best I ever did was 26. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, probably. And I'm only 5'8. So, yeah, so it's yeah like, I probably yeah. was 25, 26. Yeah. I, I narrowed it off. I still ride like 24. But, it, but <laughs> it's like. 23. So. Right, yeah, yep, no, I, yep. I, I love it. But, yep. um, but so, it, you know, again, it's just like that time, um, there was that early wave and the world and all that stuff. Then there was like that second wave, that whole new school thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we, when we were doing twist, it was just the very precursor of what turned into sort of this new school movement. And it's you, the thing that people have to understand that there, there was no internet, right? Like literally. Yeah. There was trans world. Totally. You know, there was still ISM, um, international snowboard magazine and snowboarder, was there yeah um but they were very much california companies california coverage totally they weren't covering any of the stuff that we were doing right right and we had this whole crazy microcosm of stuff going on in in summit county um and that's what spun out of like what we were talking about then, like the us trying to create the internet with mixtapes and, <laughs> yeah. and magazines yeah. and calendars uh, and zines, zines and big and, zines yeah. and small zines and totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and videos like, vi- yeah, that's what reached us. Like I had moved from the East coast. Well, I moved from Ontario, which is the middle mm-hmm. of the country kind of to the West coast. Yeah. And the videos were, were everything. Yeah. Like I remember seeing roadkill and then the next year being at Mount Baker and being like, I'm in the fucking video. Like, yeah. this is crazy. And like, even being here, seeing, I get what the terrain is now. Like, I get how that riding style came out of here with, mostly with the jibbing. Yeah. Like, it's it seems like it's a perfect place for, you know, like people to, it's like a skate park. Yeah. So everybody's got these wide stances. They're hitting everything everywhere. Yeah. And, and uh, there's a good vibe. It's it's a crazy place, man. It's, it's it, it is pretty crazy, and people like to love to hate Colorado, but it's like yeah, I've never heard any Colorado hate, but I oh well, there's yeah. there's a fair amount of it, um, <laughs> but it, whatever it doesn't it doesn't affect me. I still have just as much fun, but we right, but so that so we started that ourselves, and again we didn't we hadn't. I mean, I'm trying to think of what we actually had to really inspire us besides skate companies twist was unique the year that we brought it up to canada it was bold and it was new and it was not what we were used to it was it was well it was a total it was fresh it was a total 180 from what anybody was used to because we didn't like what there was that was all there (laughs) was um but i mean there was no vulcan there was no nothing special blend Mm -mm. i mean quite literally there was nothing and so all we could do is create the thing that we wanted, mm-hmm. um, it, which was just a total rebellion against the stuff that we had. Yeah, there was something going on. I remember we got it for a year and we got lots and it was great. And then I think we got relegated to like second tier, the second year possibly. Like, and then some stuff didn't arrive or there, you know, like the the typical probably. outerwear. <laughs> Absolutely, thing probably. Of, of like, yeah, you had, yeah. You we, had 20 year olds making your. Yeah, clothes. and we're going, and we're going, okay, well, <laughs> we accidentally ordered too much of the thing we don't want and we want the thing that sold out right away. So give us a bunch of that. And then you go, hey, it's already sold out everywhere. I like, don't know. You can't get any more. I but don't know. I, I do remember it being 
like we're not talking about clear outs or close outs or anything. That's everything that you make gets sold full price yeah. through retailers, right? That Well, that was the only place, that's the only way you could sell it. Yeah. Retailers were the only thing that there was. Or maybe you could do like a, there were a couple of mail order catalogs, I guess, but there was, again, yeah. no no internet. But so we, so we did, in the early 90s, you know, we started, and, you know, like Tarquin was a huge influence, um, huge innovator, of course, and, and again, part of that next wave, Quinn Sandvold, like all of those, the other Boulder kids um, that kind of went off and did a lot of really cool stuff um, and influenced us. And we all were hanging out together. They were riding for us, whatever, and, and working together. But then Justin Hasenek mm. um, moved to Boulder. Cool. And that was a really interesting thing because we were um, doing Twist and just sort of, we had opened up an office above a restaurant that I showed you. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm trying to remember exactly how Justin, how he just kind of assimilated into what we were doing. Was he already a photographer at that he point? He was a photographer, so he was doing the calendars. So he was oh. doing ver- vertical addictions. Vertical addictions, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. And so, um, yeah, he was doing that. We He wasn't doing, I mean, nobody was really doing a whole lot of video. I mean, there were, of course, there were the... Mac Dog and but, Standard, but, but, right. I, I mean, in like local covering that thing and so right we started doing movies the twist movies what was the first twist movie uh it was just the twist promotional video it was yeah. called and that was in 19 we filmed it in 1990 yeah and it came out in 1991 yeah and it was a really mixed bag because again that was right at that turning point so we had i mean like we had the craziest team that <laughs> that just it was just friends so tim wendell is in the video. Oh, wow. You know, and he's on the end of... Oh, like, yeah. Sort of his pro I saw him thing. in 1990. Yeah. And, yeah. He came out, he did like a an attempt at a hand plant, and he flew off into the bushes, and then he picked up his board and went into the <laughs> chalet. Like, yeah, this place sucks. <laughs> and he's, and he's a, like, he's a good friend. And But yeah. But so we were, you know, we still had some of that. Um, Brian Delaney, you know, so Kevin's little brother. Yep. Um, and these are all just people we, we grew up with, went to high school with. Um, Tarquin, like that was that crew. And then we met Justin and he started working out of our office and then he just became, he was staff photographer for snowboarder at the same time. Yeah. And then he just became our team manager. Amazing. Yeah. No, it was insane. And so then that's when that wave of, of Nate Cole and Jay Nelson, Jay sent a, I saw his sponsor me tape which is super funny um (laughs) gilligan yoder of course brian harper um i mean i could just you just keep going down the list and there's so many people who rode first that time but that's how justin got involved so then we our our first real video yeah uh was anthem it was a favorite and we watched it like i could i could quote all the shit from it (laughs) you know (laughs) you guys with with uh sponsors not buying ad space go find another jump (laughs) yeah no yeah puffy and spray (laughs) yeah Yeah. unreal dude like that was our legit like you'd watch that and then you'd go out and try those tricks yeah totally and there was actually some there was actually some really good stuff in there really good stuff but mostly there was good style yeah and there was like a cultural message yeah. of like, hey, this is who we're going to be now. Yeah. This is what we are as a culture. We're going to be a bit fucking badass. Yeah. And we're not going to listen to shitty, stupid rules. Yeah. And yeah, like we're skaters on the snow. We were not. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it's actually really funny and this is going to sound terrible. I remember <laughs> one of those years, man, it might have been the year that, you know, that Palmer beat. Craig Kelly and the half pipe. Was that 91 or 92? It's like 91 or, or maybe 92. Yeah. yeah. I just remember thinking, oh, they're still doing the worlds. <laughs> like quite like, li- like literally. And that's how, that's how far <laughs> things had changed from that changing my life to yeah. me just not paying any attention to organized snowboarding in any respect from the, right. The contest to the magazines yeah. to everything. And so that's, we just, your we team did it all ourselves. You your know? team isn't giving you a resume saying I got eighth at the worlds or whatever. No, I mean, yeah. I mean, they'd be like, what's the world? Yeah. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. 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 <laughs> totally. But what contests have you been to? None. Yeah, like, exactly. I don't do those. Those suck. Yeah. And that was, and right. I think that was the big pivot actually now thinking about it. Now yeah. that you bring that up. I mean, it's just like, you know, snowboarding going from, 
a, a discipline in a lot of ways, actually even of skiing. Yep. Bumps contests and slalom and GS and you right. had to do everything. Right. You had to, you, you literally were forced to do all the disciplines. Which is so silly. Yeah, when so The more I hear people talk about <laughs> it, the more crazy it is. Like they would have to engineer a contest so that, you know, the race was first so that they could disqualify people from the pipe if they didn't ride in the race. In the, exactly. They didn't do it the other way around. Like, <laughs> hey, you don't get to race if you don't go in that Yeah, they did pipe. it first, and you, yeah. and you had to ride, you had yeah. to be in the bumps contest. And you had, you know, it's <laughs> yeah. just like the moguls contest. Which is contest. so rude. It's, it's mean. It's, it's not super, even, it, it, it just shows a lack of understanding of what's actually happening yeah. in the culture. But, it, you know, if you look at the lineage and where it came from, it came from, that I mean, it came from the the ski disciplines, of course. And well, they're people, trying to be legit too, yeah, right? Oh, like totally. they're they're just trying to be legit. Like, hey, look at us. We do what you do, and that was and, and that and, was a big and everybody does that was that. a big part of yeah. it. And also, you know, those early contests too. I mean, there there weren't. I mean, you couldn't. I mean, you could make a half pipe if you got some shovels <laughs> and dug them, and we did that. Yeah, but it was very lackluster. Sure, you know, early pipe contests like the the early world world contests, the best stuff going on were the side hits and and the jumps that everyone was building and you yeah. know sean farmer doing backflips and yeah. <laughs> you know like things yeah. that i'd never seen before in my life absolutely and everybody lining up all day just lapping these hits and and uh, all the people that were there because everybody that was there was a snowboarder nobody there weren't like spectators there was no hospitality <laughs> tent you know there were no free drinks right. and so everybody was there for that and so people would like begrudgingly go take their run right because they got called like they yeah. were up and yeah. then they would come back and keep yeah everybody keep hitting the Craig quarter pipe and Bert, <laughs> yeah. and you know like if you you'd yeah. see those guys training gates <laughs> yeah. and you'd be like how lame <laughs> they're taking it seriously like this is fun this yeah. is just fun stuff yeah yeah so yeah. anyway i yeah. mean so it, you get a picture of what it, what that was uh, but all i think about that's a per that's a perfect pivot is that you know if you don't force your team to to be in that pigeonhole like look our guys like when you think about the burn team coming in like spandex uniforms yeah, totally. like when tom burt's talking about that oh you didn't see the movie dear rider but not yet he, he talks about it and, he, and you could just see in his face that you know the west coast guys see the burton team and they're in a uniform yeah and the uniform is like a spandex thing totally it's like what the fuck are you doing yeah totally those yeah. bright the bright, bright red performer speed suits right yeah totally and and i mean granted sure the racers wear speed suits that's yeah. something that they do but i've definitely seen people race in regular clothing and win oh 100 so, yeah, yeah, yeah totally and and again like at that point too that we were so far past the caring about any sort it was yeah it was one up in each other free riding and making people were just making up the craziest stuff because <laughs> nothing it was like i mean talking about earlier about like when people learned that they could ollie a skateboard on flat ground yeah like that was what snowboarding was at that time because everything was new mm -hmm. and somebody would hit something and it was insane and then somebody else would try to hit a switch and it was just, you know what i mean it was just like absolutely it was always one-upmanship yeah but none of that one upmanship was like happening on the slalom course like it was like, <laughs> right you know what i mean so that so our of whole course. crew was just about literally like crewing up and just just going everywhere yeah exploring everything that's where all the stumps and the rainbows and all the things that that were found in all these different places it wasn't again from training gates it was from <laughs> getting out there and and actually trying to skateboard on snow and and part of it probably just guessing here but part of it's probably not pretending like the party wasn't a big part of the gathering you know what i mean like yeah. like craig going to bed to get a good night's sleep to try and win the overall title the next day yeah. is missing like the key element of that those events in in some ways right like the anthem stuff encouraged us to go out in a crew ride around drink beers on the lift yeah well that's because that was what it was yeah that was the fun of it yes and for us and it was always and for me even to this day it's about the the whole 24 hours <laughs> it's not about the three hour skate session or about the <laughs> five hours on the mountain yes because yeah that's super fun and that's all part of it but mm -hmm. so are the pitchers and the nachos totally you know what i mean and Absolutely. like and then going out at night and doing all that stuff and and 
going out and being hungover and and doing it all over. I mean, that was it was a it was the music you listened to. It was the places you hung out. It was the the girls you met. Like yeah. it was all part of it. There was no money in it, and there was <laughs> money though for again the organized side of things. And of course, Craig and you know all of those guys. There there was prize money, and that they were professionals. And yes. there was there was a it was a job that they loved, but they there was a paycheck. Yeah. For us, I mean, we lived on Taco Bell totally. and we lived on the floor because that's what that's what we that's all we had to support. Yeah. You know, and yeah, we yeah, yeah. and even you know the early days of Twist and stuff, we didn't pay ourselves like anything. I remember going to the SIA show, like the 1991 SIA show in Vegas, and being so excited because we got to eat buffet every night <laughs> at Circus Circus or at, at yeah. Excalibur. Yeah. Like this wasn't even like Caesars. This yeah, was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. These I, are the, I've eaten at both of exactly. those. This wasn't the lobster yeah. buffet at yeah. Caesars. This was no. the, you know, back then, <laughs> which was the kind of gold standard of buffets. But but no, I mean, so, you know, we we did it because we loved it. And we were absolutely convinced that w- the kind of snowboarding we were doing was what the future represented. Yeah, it was progression. It was progression, and, and it was, and again, it was that there was that whole lifestyle part of it. So those early shows, the you know SA shows, the events, if there were, if even if there were contests and things, and people were in town, like you would go and have fun. Messing they would go around. do the contests, and, yeah. and we would, and it would, but again, it was that that whole twenty four hour thing, and that's where. Like Breckenridge became that epicenter early of literally like twenty four hour lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it was just it was it was super super fun. There was at a all hi- times. There was a hike pipe at, in, during one era of Breckenridge that I that I heard about, like that had lights on it all night or something. I think Jimmy Scott there, would go there. Oh, there were there were there were, there were a lot of lit up pipes. They had yeah. one at Keystone. They had one at Vale. Rad. Yeah, no, totally. Oh, that's super rad. They were super, and they were actually they were, like the one at Vale, the gondola. It was like like you could hike it, of course. But yeah. You could also, oh, actually, you took the gondola up that side. That's right, and then you would hike it. Yeah. And they had a, I think they had a rope tow. I don't know, or a little chairlift. But they're and Keystone, same thing. I mean, they were super rad. Super night pipes, night parks, and all that. I think one of the best things about um, linking up with someone like Justin, is that the symbiotic relationship happens where. The better the riders get, the more money he makes. Yeah. And the more money he makes, the more money the riders make. Because if he's submitting more, they're getting photo incentives. They're getting sponsorship oh, for deals. Sure. And he's getting paid for editorial. And he's getting paid by the companies for product shots and for ad shots. And Yeah, it, and we were it, paying, as the, paying him as the, the team manager. And, yeah. And he actually became part of the company with, with – he was – a partner in the company you yeah. know yeah no for sure yeah it, it was super beneficial for us i mean yeah. it, it was and because of especially being sort of one of the top you know staff photographers at, at snowboarder he was also traveling globally right so he's the one that that you know put ingmar on our team Sick. yeah or or um daniel frank Oh, you know, wow. Jakob, like, I mean, there was a, there was a whole crew of Europeans, Yanni Vara, um, just so many people that we would have never even really known who they were. So like, the, this, like, yeah, like, yeah. like the Ingmar shot, yeah. you know, the famous, yeah. you know, he's that he's wearing twist pants, you know, nobody <laughs> knows that, but, but it's like we, it, you know, it was really, really cool that we were able to do that. That was one of the failings of the the what we were asking for as snowboarders was that you know in the past wave rave it said wave rave on the knees you know what i mean west beach there was the west beach logo on the knees you knew what pants it was from you know very distinct design stuff like the burton freestyle stuff yeah and twist had very small logos on purpose totally (laughs) totally on purpose because that's how like my you know, my skate stuff didn't have logos all over it. Right. My, my plain black T-shirt and my <laughs> my jeans, you know, didn't yes. have logos yes. on it. And th- so that again, it was just it was a it was just a an extension mm-hmm. of of that. Yeah. Um, and again, it, it was all rebellion against everything else that was going on because everything else was so neon and logoed and crazy. Totally. We're just like we. This is not 
who Subtle, we are and what we want to do. Little, yeah, no, little totally. Hits and we also, down here. Yeah. We, and we also, we were, we we couldn't do some of those things because we weren't like working with like the best factories. You know, <laughs> sure. we're screen printing things ourselves. Nice. So it was just, it was all, it was super DIY. And and what we did do, like if we put something on it, we put like with Evan Hecox we were talking about. So Evan, who went on to do, you know, be chocolate skateboards, main artist for decades and worked with Nike and Adidas and all the stuff. But he, um, we met him, I was 18, he was 19, I think, maybe 19 and 20. Um, so he became part of the early Twist crew too. So he was our first artist of art that we weren't doing ourselves. There's an aesthetic. There's an aesthetic. And, and so we would put so little pieces of like a little face that he'd draw. Yeah. You yeah. know, that would be the logo. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Instead of like the words, you yeah. know, like yeah. we very actually rarely put the words twist on anything. We had that early crown logo yep. that had kind of twist in the, in the crown. But then after that, it really just, beca- we, we almost, I don't think we really almost put, the words to us on the outside of anything. It's so incredible to think of, you know, what the reality of twist was for us at the shop was a bunch of boxes come in, we put it on the rack, it's gone. Yeah. And that's it. Like, that's like, it wasn't like, we didn't have a relationship with you where we could get restocked and do all that stuff. So then the shop later on gets filled with things with that other are stuff that that are just available yeah. you know what i mean and a lot of times things that are available are the stuff that didn't sell so yeah get, well the yeah store looks the best <laughs> in, the, in november or september october november i can remember pushing for september because people would come in yeah the shop would switch over to a water ski shop oh yeah so people would come in in september and go oh shit there used to be a snowboard shop around here somewhere do you know <laughs> do you know where that is and i'd, I'd be like oh it's, it's actually yes come back that'll in like be us in weeks. october and yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. no totally yeah so, like, it is crazy how quickly, and I'm not blowing smoke, I'm just saying, when you had something that hot in snowboarding, it would it, it just would vanish out into the ether. And it's not like people just from the magazines knew and and would see your ads and come in and say, I, I want that. It was like they'd look at all the jackets and they go, oh, fuck, I want that thing. And so just whoever came in the shop who yeah. was ever was lucky enough to need a jacket early on when it first showed up, it all got sold to just the general public. It was, I mean, it was always just the stuff that, again, it, it, it was just, it, there was just something different mm-hmm. about it. <clears throat> and it was, and it was great. And we, and we actually... We did. We started the, that sunglass line. We did all kinds of things. We did some some of the earliest women's outerwear. We did um, the we did Tuesday, which was with Tina and Shannon. After they they had done prom, we did the women's clothing company. We did Titan um, because again, we we twist was a certain thing, a certain aesthetic for a certain group of shops and all of that. But snowboarding yeah. was getting really big, and so we. We had to have something that was able to touch a little bit more of that broad thing that we were talking about, Absolutely. but it wasn't. But we didn't want it to lose that that special side of it. And yeah. so, and Titan was amazing because that's what we got to bring on. You know, again, spanning generations. So, it, Mark Frank, oh, sick. of course, was like, and he was. I mean, that was, we were. I mean, we we gave him stuff with Twist when he was like probably sixteen or seventeen. Yeah. Um. But we actually sponsored him and and Kurt Wastel, Palmer was on Ranquit. Oh. I mean, there was a there was a crew Holy on shit. on Titan as well. Um yeah. And then that whole thing just sort of <clears throat> it, it kind of imploded. Um. And then there there were versions of Twist and there remain versions of Twist out in the marketplace. That I mean, it's it's had like nine lives. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So there are different versions of it after we we had kind of lost it what happens like because i know justin basically starts absinthe i remember when the yeah. video came out and it was called absinthe it was called absinthe and the by vertical addictions it. or yeah it was it, there was some time where he was doing jah stuff right like, yeah because justin alexander Hossenek Hossenek, is right, his name right. so it's jaw yeah so that's his, his so nickname. jaw yeah, stuff jaw. okay and so Perfect. um yeah and so yeah no so it, so we were making the twist movies um anthem um so anthem was the second one then we did like a promo cut of that for twist then we did color 
mm. and the gift. Mm -hmm. And then the next one in the series was, oh, I don't know if it was absinthe or it was black box. I don't know. What oh it yeah. Was. I remember those. Yeah, both. totally. And so, um, it might've been black box first. And I think it absinthe. was, I think it was, I think black box was the next version. So it was oh, all it the been. twist right. riders, right? But right, it wasn't right. a twist movie. <laughs> right. Right. And right. so that's when he switched it over to, to absinthe. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and so we were, we were, we didn't, I mean, again, we were literally kids in a world that kids didn't start brands. <laughs> sure. And so we didn't know how to finance. We didn't have money. Right. We didn't come from money. We, you know, we did our best. It was big, borrowing, stealing. We grew it to be actually pretty big. And, and from a specialty perspective, in in store penetration, we were actually second to Burton in the amount of specialty stores we were in, which nobody, again, it's mind blowing. Yeah. Um. But we, you know, you you had to, we literally had to make sort of deals with the devil, and mm. you know, not actually, but you I know, know what but you're you, you, you. What you, about you Japan? Just, Did you have a couple of years where Japan would Japan pay was in, prepay? Japan was insane. Yeah. yeah. No, Japan was like in, incredible, but yeah, we ended up um, being financed out of Japan at the end. Yeah. Which um, happened to a lot of same, companies. Yeah, in same that guys. Era. It was um, same guys that financed Division Twenty Three. Yep. And um, and then the Japanese economy hit the skids oh, in ninety yeah, six. The yen. The yen yeah, and so and they were a public company, and they they basically just said, "Hey, you guys, um, and we, had, you know, you operate for most of the year in a seasonal business. <laughs> yep. <laughs> spending lots of money. Totally. And then you make all your stuff, and then you sell it to shops like yours, and you get the money back, and and yeah. so." We had already operated for eight months. I don't even know what it was. So we were millions in the hole, oh. and which then comes back when we make yeah. it and ship it. And the, you know, the whole right, thing. Right, and right, so right. Totally. And long story short, um, the <clears throat> board of directors, the shareholders said, you guys need to concentrate on your core business. They were a car accessory company, not a not a snowboarding company. It was kind sure. of a hobby. And, and so they're just like, oh, yeah, we can't keep, we can't keep financing it. So just uh send us a check basically for yeah, the money you yeah, owe us and yeah. and you'll get you'll get to keep going. And we we didn't we didn't have any money. Yeah. Like that. I mean yeah. there's not not even close and, and we had no resources. We had like a week. They gave us like a week. Oh shit. And so we went from we literally were at uh we had relaunched the sunglass line with Interview Magazine at Spy Bar in New York City. <laughs> like the <laughs> highest of high, this is unbelievable party and then we literally got the phone call from japan like three days later so it was like the it was like y if you're believing your own hype nothing slaps you in the face as hard <laughs> yeah. as losing everything from the highest of the high to the lowest of the low in like three days and um and and so that was that was the end you know we we traded our um our personal guarantees for the trademarks yep. um oh wow so we we got out of it Troy and I got out of it clean, you know, we, we, and it was really, I mean, it was, that was our baby, right? Yeah. And we brought so many people along for the ride and Justin and Evan and all Lisa Hudson and all these people who were in, intimately involved with the brand, all the riders, because we had given each of them, you know, pledging them that when this thing sells, everybody's going to get taken care of, like the whole thing, oh, because yeah, they were all, right. they were all our best friends. Yeah. Some of our riders were older than me. Yeah. You know, and, and it was just, it was, it was crushing it was like like literally like heartbreaking you know oh, what i mean man. yeah and it was and um and i was on the board of directors at si at that point and um so it was me it was jake burton um and then a bunch of ski dudes and yeah. i don't think there were any other i'm trying to think if there were any other snowboard people but so i got to know jake i knew him from the shop days and wave rave and all that stuff but not very well but i got to know him through the board of directors so when Twist finally was done, done, in two or three weeks later, um, we flew out to Jake's house on Long Island um, to go talk to to him about basically kind of Twist Part Two-ish yeah. and going and doing Burton's outerwear. And so- what we, was What was that like coming into Burton? Was there already <clears throat> a hierarchy of designers or stuff? Had they- had they hired outside of Burton, you know, consultants to like turn ski clothes into snowboard they, clothes at that point? They or were something? running it from inside, <clears throat> but again, it was it it was um, 
it was so weird because it was like again and, and i and it was just it was exactly kind of some of the stuff that we had been rebelling against of course you know it's still burton I, yeah like and, and, and the burton freestyle pant oh yeah and the sit without soak and all of the things that they were doing and the super short jackets and all the stuff and, yeah and it's just like, it was just it was wild um and they had a i mean they had an amazing crew there but the thing about it was it was so it was so formulaic they had all they had you know um i'm trying to remember all the trilight which then became trilight ak which then just became ak okay they had universe and tempest and they had all these little weird divisions of apparel that made sense to them right because it's in the marketplace because it was kind of like a kind of like like your different hierarchies of of waterproofness right mm-hmm. like so this is called a whatever a tempest it's exactly and, 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 and done for different right. styles of writing as well right. and the thing is that um the biolite which was the most progressive freestyle stuff yeah was also the cheapest burton biolite yeah right 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 so they and and then if it's the cheapest then it's it's also the least waterproof it's all it's the worst yeah. performance but yeah. it's the but it's supposed to be the highest style so they're that's what they're saying is they're kind of saying like look you you scrub kids on the fucking <laughs> a little mountain. bit like we know you can't afford shit so we're gonna make you uh, a, like a, a cheaper jacket that you can you know, scrape together some money but even their riders i mean the the biolite riders at that time it was jeffy anderson wow and gooch wow and um you know there were i, I know like terry was on universe and dave downing was in universe like there, that was a different part Yep. Um, but so that's when we, uh, cooked up analog because we coming in, it was just like, we have, it's just like all of these rules and we also couldn't make anything that was really good, <laughs> but that was also cool. And so everything had to fit into a box and into a rule. <laughs> right. And so we, um, so we basically, we, Troy and I and, and Greg Dakishin, um, and, and, some of the writers and we were just kind of like coming up with like these ideas of, well, shit, like we really want to do something that isn't fitting into this formula. Yes. And that we also, we can make stuff that's not $179, you know, like why can't we make a super red jacket out of Gore-Tex that isn't AK, you know, right. or right. Trilight AK or whatever it was at the time. Like we were trying to like really kind of push the needle and again, try to not really have those rules. So that's where Analog was born out of. And for us, it was like kind of like twist part two. And we started with BioLite. We did a BioLite X jacket and the BioLite Y jacket, you know, because <laughs> they wouldn't let us do it. Yeah. And so it took it took a lot of talking into, uh, talking them into it. And I, I remember the distinctly um, at one of the roundtables. So we used to do these, these rider roundtables. At Jake, they Jake, still do Jake's them. barn. Yeah, of yep. course. Yep. Um, and we were, we were sitting there during the BioLite roundtable. Um, and we had just sort of gone off the reservation and like made some things ourselves. Nice. That, that were, you know, like a snorkel jacket, like a parka and like all these things. And, Sick. And uh, Jeffy Anderson like literally jumped up on the table and Jake was in the roundtable. And Jeffy's like, oh my God, that's what I've, that's what I've wanted the whole time. That's, what, you know, the yeah. whole thing. Yep. And so that was, that was super cool because that's, because Jake's, the best thing he ever did was always listen to the writers, right. right? And that was something that there was such a it was such a moment that I don't think there had ever been that level of excitement in a round table ever. <laughs> and so that was kind of that was sort of the the turning point. Even though the rest of sort of the organization, the sales organization, they did it the first two years that didn't really like it or want it. Yeah, so they're like <laughs> internally fighting against this thing that. Any snowboarder that was exposed to it, like myself, for example, Jeff Martino had his sample sale. Yeah. And I bought pretty much everything in my size of analog. Yeah. That that was, I mean, it spoke to me. Because nobody else wanted it. Because it was like, (laughs) it was out there. It was out there. It was out there, which is exactly what you want. It's like, you you show up to the mountain and you're wearing the same jacket as someone else. It's kind of embarrassing. Yeah. Especially if the guy's like, you know, a beginner. Yeah, and, and oh, he's got sure. your same kit, and you're like, hey, yeah. you got a twin there." Yeah, no, the analog stuff was risque. It was, a, and yeah, <laughs> and but, it was dope. But even the early, the earliest stuff was actually pretty simple. Okay, it was the same kind of thing. Like, um, it was actually—I mean, you look at it. The, 
there was art on it. I mean, it was it yes. was yes. literally yes. Yes. Twist yes. Part Two, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, continued yeah. and yeah. and um, no, it was it, so that was that was super cool and and did that for a few years, um, and then you know no regrets whatsoever. We yeah. Troy and I lived in Boulder still. We we commuted. Yeah. Um, and we did all, we had our little design office in Boulder. You know what? I'm going to have to cut all that out because it wasn't analog. I'm thinking of Ronix or, uh, yeah. Or oh, Ronin. 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 Oh, yeah, Ronin. Ronin came out. So it's, that's after, right? Yeah, that was analog. That was, analog eventually. Analog, but it becomes kind of AK or something. R- analog became its own thing. Okay. And it became sort of the Burton action sports brand it's still it's still going and right now oh right 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 okay sorry sorry yeah i'm not like a super good burton historian because yeah, oh, totally. i didn't have access to this stuff yeah did you have anything to do with that uh ronin stuff we designed ronin we did that was yeah. the shit that was risque that was like like holy fuck <laughs> these guys have lost their minds and also in the best way possible. Yeah, Ronan was, and yeah. that was Greg's yeah. special baby. So Ronan was very much Greg. Dude, Jackson, like that shit was yeah. like, it was. It wasn't Burton at all. <laughs> yeah. It was like if Burton was forced to make something. Yeah, that they they just. I could see people like frowning about those pieces. There was a lot of stuff in there that was. It was pretty crazy. And analog yeah. was was. Um, it was just the first departure. The, precur- for, the for, precursor to to some of the more out there stuff. Yeah, but some yeah. of the more out, uh, out there stuff really did make it into analog and analog became almost the whole yeah, separate like you're branch Jeffy of Jeffy with the big jacket. Oh like, yeah, no totally. Like, yeah. Yeah. And and those like those orange suits, the early orange oh, suits. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff. That was all that was all analog stuff. That was Jay Brown. Je- that was that Jason was, Brown hundred percent. He was there. Yeah. Of course. Loving um, that loving that. Chris era. Brown um Oh shit Roman. He, yeah. Roman. And yeah. uh God there's uh, there were a lot of yeah, there's guys really, shouting really, right really now. Good. I was there. I was yeah, there. <laughs> no, totally, totally. <laughs> yeah, it's that. That sometimes the podcast turns into that, just like a name remembering. Oh yeah, no, I game. Yeah, and it's, I could, it's impossible. Probably, yeah. <laughs> list and keep going on and on about yeah. lists. But so then we we um we did that for a number of years, and it was it was interesting because um, while Burton was a big snowboarding company, what our role had become was not. It didn't feel really that it revolved around snowboarding so much as traveling a lot okay going to factories going to events right going to japan you know um super fun things i'm not gonna lie but it 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 didn't feel as much about snowboarding and and i was like died in the wool like love love snowboarding. i got you um and it was more in because we weren't riders Right. So it, what about the we, Burton? We got kind of right, you away know, from it, you know, ten inch rule or whatever it is. As soon as that snow falls, that the whole office closes down and everyone goes riding. That happens. Yeah. Oh no, totally. And I'm not. Oh, th- there were plenty, of course, of snowboarders, but yeah. at Burton, and it was a, it's a snowboarding company. Yeah. But for my role, I'm saying, was not as you got too twist, deep into twist the was so, into the guts. Well, yeah. twist was so it was just it was a crew and it was. 24 hours and it was <laughs> we were doing product but we were doing sales we were doing marketing we because it was all part of it you know and when we got to Burton Troy and I we we only focused on designing apparel so and, then you, and then gloves and things like that and so we're we just, searching for materials so, and, and you're yeah doing and all totally and which yeah. I still do that to, to today but I I love it, it goes back to that whole 24 hour mentality of sort of snowboarding or skateboarding but it's the same thing on the work side of it i we were so like one note mm. that it just started getting old and i think probably like even my being that into it was just on the wane so troy and i left and that's when we started section with with mark frank and, oh, and sick. did that whole thing that was you guys too mm-hmm. yeah holy shit <laughs> yeah that was us so we did that for uh, again number of years and that's so when do we, you move back here like well, were you so living in we were living in boulder and we were commuting um you know every month every couple of months whatever it was because we would have our deliverables we would do it out of boulder and wow. then we would go back and and present everything and do everything with the the team there yeah i just you know i didn't i was so uh, so in love with 
snowboarding the whole thing that I didn't I I just loved it here. Yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I it mean. It was burning you out, right? It right. was, and I just loved to be, and so we were here the kind of that that whole time. But so we started section oh, out, right, out, right. Of, Sorry, out yeah, of yeah, Boulder, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. um, and that's when like so like we sponsored actually Ethan Forty Eight Eastone. Yeah, um, when he was on Titan back in the day with with Marco and and Kurt Wastel and all that. Um, when he started Tech Nine in Vail, and so then they were kind of having the same issues of being a small little tiny. Is he doing that with his dad? With his dad, I met his dad. Yeah, I met Ray. him and his dad. Yeah. Ray. Ray was yeah. the main yeah. guy. W- totally. When uh, when Murray up in in uh, Vancouver was yeah. doing Tech Nine across totally. Canada. Totally. Totally. What a dude. Yeah, and so yeah. and so we, um, but they were kind of having a hard time with like the cash flow and all that stuff, and so we, then we brought them into the fold. So cool. It was like Section and Tech Nine. Yeah, and then we met um, <laughs> the Chamberlain brothers at ISPO. So Simone and Matt and those guys, yeah. and they were doing Nomus. And yeah, they were same thing. They needed to find ways to grow, and so we brought them into the fold. I mean, it was just like this. So whole... Nomus came in under a, a branding thing with you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With with yeah, me heard. and then with Ethan and yeah. you know and again it, it, those were weird years in snowboarding because it was such a business and Nomus went insane Nomus went insane he, yeah it was it got really big it, it, and like, really insane. and like the the amount of hoodies that we were selling was like <laughs> it was really crazy and yeah. you would like you couldn't make enough hoodies like just straight honest and, and enough variations weird. and enough yeah you know all that stuff yeah and, yeah, and so that I mean, so again, it's just like, you know, what decade is it? The eighties, the nineties, the two thousands? Like, always been trying to sort of push, um, in snowboarding and and do all that kind of stuff. And so that kind of brings us to where we're sitting now because it's like, through that whole process and through being like front row seat to snowboarding from, literally the earliest days of of you know, pre edges pre. <laughs> high backs pre whatever <laughs> yeah um and and feeling the whole time because i was sort of a front row seat of the whole thing just always being the the super fan of you know of tom sims and of what jake was doing and all these different people were doing chucky barfoot and what like all these guys and nobody was paying any attention to it it felt like mm. and so i just started throwing stuff in the basement, throwing stuff in the closet, throwing stuff, you know, whatever I could get um, with this intention of always doing something that would sort of not just uh, show like all this cool stuff, but actually sort of tell the story and memorialize the, what actually happened for snowboarding to get from there to here. That's rad. Yeah. And so that's when I started that, the museum project trying for years and years to do it on my own. But it, you just people don't pay money to go see snowboards um, <laughs> yet. You know, <laughs> you've been talking about this this whole time uh, about how be- because of how early you got into it. You know what I mean? Like the frustration with like, yeah, I mean, people come and look at it, but they're not going to pay money no. because they don't understand how um, historically significant each of these pieces is. Yeah. But every kind of year it gets like more and more interest in where did this thing come from yeah and i mean the the more i dig into it the more of these incredible personalities like steve link oh yeah of course and i mean like i always knew farmer was farmer yeah. but i didn't realize who farmer was yeah. you know <laughs> no, totally. like it's insane yeah and there's and dimitri and there is a lot to snowboard history there's a there's a ton and the nice thing about it is almost all of it is recent enough that you can actually document it yeah so I, you know, starting in the, so I actually, and I, I do remember this and I, and I, I know I kind of gloss over like contests and all that stuff in that one time, but there was a, even during that period of time, I had friends, a lot of rider friends who were kind of being not swept under the carpet, but just didn't, they were, they were the, they were old school. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And this whole new school thing was happening, yeah. and so I'm like, I'm going to make sure that people don't forget about some of these people in particular. Yeah. yeah. Who? Yeah. yeah. Snowboarding would not even be close to the same yeah. without them. 
but mm-hmm. people literally don't know who they are or what their names. And you're yeah, you're doing an amazing job of that. Thank of, you of very much. Those, I've, keeping uh, those stories I mean, they're alive. My, they're my favorite type of stories. Yeah, is to find out that Dave Dowd competed in the X Games till he was 39. Yeah, because for me, Dave Dowd was the what I was exposed to with Dave Dowd, which was you know like an ice ski, you know, shot of him doing you know a sucked up air in some powder somewhere yeah or like the or like a hard boot in front (laughs) soft boot in back yeah and and finding out that george (laughs) pappas had the opposite setup because he was goofy and (laughs) and dave was regular so they they shared two pairs of boots boots. isn't that insane it's It's so great that's we need to know these things no totally and that's so so just like everything else we're the early adopters on this stuff and eventually the general public is going to enjoy these stories. Yeah, oh, for sure. That's going to happen. And and it was really... So I've been working on this, the museum stuff, for decades, mm-hmm. um, all the way along, and really trying to document, even just with my own memories, mm-hmm. and, and trying to dig things out and figuring out those things. I, and lucky enough to have known most every single person personally. Yeah, Um That's And again, nuts. not because I'm anything special only because i was just happened to be lucky enough to be there and you're paying and, attention and meet though. them That's yeah true. until and meet them when no, nobody cared sure you know and and to then yeah and build a relationship and try to to figure that out you know the the only people that i, I like i i i've never known dimitri but but pretty much everybody else isn't so. he from right around here he's a uh, utah Oh yeah, he's Utah. Sorry, I'm yeah, thinking. Oh yeah, no Salt problem. Salt Lake. I'm, yeah, I'm no, there in two days. Yeah, no, no Jesus. problem. But yeah, and so and so that you know, but everybody else and I, I did go out um, and try to find some people at the beginning of this when I, I forged this alliance with the Colorado Ski Museum at the time, mm-hmm. which is Colorado's official ski museum around since 1976, funded, yeah. you know, uh, established, um, not funded by the state or anything, but but with members and memberships and fundraisers and all of that stuff in a facility and lots of goodwill from the from uh, well, from ski enthusiasts or lots yeah. of goodwill and and you know maybe not so much on the snowboard side but um but the people that ran the museum and that were too were, early that's, we're very that's we're is, very yeah. interested in in preserving the history and talking about it um and very welcoming to the opportunity to, to possibly do that and so then it was just a matter of reaching out to the snowboard community. A uh, couple people in particular, David Alden, uh, Kurt Olesic, and, and Kevin Kinnear had kind of come back to me from this massive email thing that I'd sent. There were like three people who really wanted to be involved, and so we kind of worked together. And, and between us all, I mean, David is OG, OG, you know, building boards with Jake, like doing, he, he's done so much over the years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so he he knew the the holes that I didn't know as well personally he knew cool and um and and so we were just able to to actually go to all of our friends and heroes and where there's a lot of people with a lot of good collections but these are Tom's boards <laughs> you know these are the ones he made Dude, with the his hands these are the, the Jake's boards things. these were Chucky's boards that they made and yeah you yeah. know and and didn't just make but made for all of us after 15 iterations of things that didn't work totally. we got the ones that worked yeah you know what i yeah. mean and yeah. so it, it it's just so interesting to see the process and it, and to know especially again pre internet pre anything um what it actually took to create something that actually worked really well <laughs> right <laughs> there's an interesting trend in snowboard collecting mm-hmm. i mean I, I was a collector when you'd see a snowboard at a garage sale for five bucks and it's a santa cruz tau and you're like yeah. i might ride that yeah. you know what i mean yeah totally like all the boards that i got were either you know just like five dollar fines ten dollar fines free i got a free rank with that's sitting in the back yeah. in my basement right now that just someone put it on craigslist like Anyone want this old yeah, you know, totally. board with a Gibson guitar Use on Use snowboard. Yes, I'll take it. It's <laughs> yeah, free. Totally. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, but at that time, you could get pretty much, you know, there's a really big community with the, the, the what's Vintage Snowboard Trader. Yep. And I don't know how it is now. I'm sure it's still fairly much like this, but 
you know, if you really wanted a board like that Nitro Diablo 186 that I'm looking at right here, yeah. if that was your goat, if that was your unicorn, you might have, you had this huge group of people that was kind of looking out for you and going, oh, here, you know, there's one over here. Yeah. And it's 20 bucks and I'll buy it and shipping to you is 80 bucks or whatever. Yeah, no, totally. But it's gone to like, the newer group that's always interesting to me is like, snowboard value whatever that one is like yeah. what's my board worth yeah, kind of stuff yeah, no for sure vintage snowboard estimates yeah that's what it's called <laughs> and i'll i'll look on that and be like well what's a you know what is a a ketchup mustard craig kelly worth these days because 10 years ago it was like 200 bucks it's gonna be mint yeah oh for sure it's gotta be maybe not ever mounted no binding rash cool story no demo you know what i mean yeah, like no, totally. and now it's like a broken Craig Kelly to put on your wall is like 800 bucks yeah, or no, something. Yeah, no, oh, for sure. You look at boards that were trash to ride and they're, and people are collecting them like they're like this, again, like goat of some sort. And the boards were literally trash, but I, but again, they're, I, that's collecting, I guess. And, you, me- and- you mentioned <laughs> D23 and there were some boards there where we probably brought in 20 boards to the shop, maybe 30. The warranty rate was very high. Mm-hmm. So I imagine most of those, you know, even the Joyride board that you have here, that's a good one. That Dale's board would not have broken, but, no. the, but the flower pot boards had a high warranty. Those those did have a high warranty, but I I wouldn't put those in the in the in the category of none of those of are trash, crap, right? No, because they were progressive. I'm talking about like yeah. foam core snow, <laughs> snowboards from the weird '80s period. When, oh god, when you know certain brands were making wood core, certain brands were making foam core, and one somebody won that battle. Yeah, you know, and, yes. and just so so some yeah. of those and boards like it's crazy. Like you'll you'll drive around and. and there was a time like up here in the sort of in the mountains like where you were today i think like old cabins and stuff and you just see you'd, there'd be a you know a a back hill just nailed to the side of the house cuz yeah, it was like dude. somebody's you know yep. it was just just on like the side skis of the house. you yeah, see yeah. skis you see skis old so, skis i like, actually yeah. i know some i'm not going to mention them here but i know some places just up in the mountains where people have made fences out yeah. of out of skis yeah and there's snowboards on the fence that are you know, going for a thousand bucks right now on on eBay, and they're just like part of somebody's fence. You could just go you, on the side of the street right now and go. Yeah, get it. you could probably go. You could probably even legitimately go up to the door, <laughs> knock on the door, <laughs> tell the guy, "Look, I'll give you fifty bucks and replace these with yeah, some no, broken totally, ass skis I got at totally, the thing." No, it's totally, yeah, it's yeah. totally right. But you know, I, it's so the the you know long story short, in all of this is that um, the giving, but my my way to give back has been to try to dig that history out and actually talk about it and talk about it again coming back to the Colorado as the neutral ground yes. from a neutral perspective yeah. Yeah. and just dig out the dig out the boards get them from the people who made them mm-hmm. and again they're not this isn't something that somebody could buy in a store because these boards that I was just showing you, some of Tom's collection, prototypes, yeah, they, yeah, and and unfinished things that, stuff and from the factory, and, and, and barely started stuff, just be, that show his with his hand, handwriting, writing, his doodles, and, and, all that, and all stuff. of his dimensions and all of his, it, because again, what did it take? Especially then, when you literally, if you wanted a snowboard, you had to make one with your <laughs> with with your hands, right? Yeah. And um, if you wanted something better, you had to make it. And so again, in this sort of initial stage of the reach out, and that's where we got so many of these. And like you're talking about the Diablo, like yeah, you can find those. You can't find Quinn's Diablo. <laughs> yeah. And there yeah. and there it is, right? Yeah. Because, yes. Um, yes. And so all of the boards, they it, there's a there's a factor there of importance of that these were the the actual boards from the actual riders or the actual makers um and so that's been sort of my goal it's in in you know showing what it took showing what it takes um and and having things that you you just can't you're just not going to find anywhere else. They're you priceless. know, Craig, Craig yeah. Kelly's boards. That you yeah, know. that that Craig's board. Holy shit! Yeah. So we have yeah. you know the um and and a lot of these things are on loan. Like these aren't my boards. I'm I'm the caretaker. Yeah. And the museum's the caretaker of them. Yeah. But a lot of it's on on loan because we wouldn't even ask for 
hey, give me those boards. Like, no, we want to show them. We want to celebrate them, right? And so, mm-hmm. so Craig's boards. So Brian Kelly had um, put those on loan with us. So it's we have one of his Craig's mystery airs. You know, that's with uh, that actually in the screen print says mystery air, which none of them did. There yeah. were only like three of those, I think. With and it's only Craig's stance in the insert pattern, right? Because it was literally Craig's board. The we have the the black top which is the same board, but when he was in the lawsuit, you know, with the, the Dorfman versus Burton. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, yeah. that whole thing yeah. where Craig couldn't ride a board with graphics. So that's Craig's board. And then, of course, we have the, the split board he was uh, skinning on when he was, you know, caught in the avalanche and, and passed away uh, with the broken left ski and the whole thing. It's just like, and, and those are the things for me um, to be able to, not only, you know, I don't, again, it's, there's no ownership of these things. It's sharing it and letting people understand the stories. And, and yeah, you're not a collector help. for money. No, and no. This is going to oh, go God. up in value and we're going to sell it for a million zero bucks percent, when it's worth, no. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that, that has never been the goal. And I've never, I've never collected things with that of an, you know, as the intention. It's always just right. been, okay, I want to tell the actual real story. Cool. And I don't want... And again, the artifacts and the dates, you know, of course, people can contest things. They can do all the things. But we've managed over now 15 years or 20 years to pretty pretty compelling case. Yeah. Or at least know the stories behind a lot of these things. Yeah, the you boards, convinced me on the Sims thing. Yeah. 100%. And, and the, the boards going the back into the, in the 30s, yeah. you know, the, the Wickland boards, which are actually called, the company was called Bunker. And the board was actually called the Snow Surf, wow. and yeah, and yeah. and so Wickland, Vern Wickland was one of the partners, but Ber- the Ferguson brothers, um, Harvey and and Gunnar, were the other side of that. So there were two families involved in those snowboards, and I, I tracked down Donald Bergeson, who's the son of one of the Bergeson brothers, and he has all of the uh, the correspondence from the wood bending company in 1934. <laughs> you know, the the all of the trademark when they're talking about it being a snow surf, all of the sales materials, the trade show, they did a trade show in, in Chicago, you know, <laughs> um, in the thirties. Uh, they have the rejection letter from Wilson Sporting Goods saying that they didn't like that. And so it's like, yeah. you know, and all the the footage and, and, and they have a patent, you know, it's just it's like- uncontestable. It is, but, yeah. but people still like to think that it was just- Jake trying to <laughs> prove Tom wasn't first. <laughs> right, you know what I mean? Right, it's just right, like right. It, 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 people get so crazy and so ridiculous. And, yeah. You know, all of these things. And, and I don't think Jake <laughs> re- really put any I- effort into proving that he was first. I think he did exactly what you did. And he pulled out a board from the 20s and just went, this it, it was just, it was too, it was too good at the time. And yeah. putting it under glass at the trade show and then having the footage. Yeah. And yeah. people were like, yeah. that footage is not real. It's like, well, yeah. actually it is because the photos of the brothers writing it, yep. they're from the 30s. They're real people. <laughs> they're the people yeah. Who, yeah. who made these things uh, and really tried to actually make a snowboard. There was something going on with Tom uh, on that on that metal board that he made. Or, uh, I remember seeing an ad where he claimed the date of the picture was... It couldn't have possibly been that time. Like he's wearing nylon gaiters that were from the seventies, and he's saying, "This is a picture of me from '64 or something." I who yeah, but who, who knows? But it just added fuel to the fire of. I think he was playing with it. I think he yeah. was like he he was like you know what if it pisses Jake off, then gr- let let's print something that's just crazy. The, the, who cares? It's not like those guys really were that good of friends no (laughs) so right right. of course you're gonna do that to people right but but also you know i mean again going back to those those words from the 60s you know i mean tom sims was was um steve link's babysitter yeah you know and like you can track people down we tracked down a bunch of people who Saw Tom riding a snowboard in the '60s, got it, and later became a, his college roommate, right? And then they all started making snowboards, right? And they and they didn't they that whole trail went dead in the '60s and '70s. Um, those guys didn't they didn't do anything with snowboarding. They didn't care, right? They just happened to have these snowboards that we went out and verified Tom's stories, and they're like, oh, and I still have this board I made, yeah, in 1972. <laughs> you should see it; it's made of 
all fiberglass and it looks it's got like a psychedelic eye on it because it's got like psychedelic <laughs> and and yeah. so they send them to us you know and and Rad. we got the stories and it's just so again yeah of course and people... thanks for doing that because <laughs> it, it is uh, if if it's just hearsay from people like i've heard that I've, I've heard it a lot and i was telling you this at supper too is that there's there's a story of jake as told by donna and his family that's now documented that's out there which is proof of what I was saying before. People are ready to see the history of snowboarding and the general public is ready to invest and watch it. Mm -hmm. So HBO made that documentary. Yeah, it's sure. really good. Yeah, sure. But it's definitely from one point of view. And then there's another point of view that's been written by people that dislike Burton that just pick the high points and say, well, Jake was this guy. He yeah. tried to sue the, you know, for the patent of the snowboard and then for <laughs> bindings. And then, you know, it, he, he did a bunch of weird kooky stuff. He said it was going to be, people really love that one. People really love to say he thought it was going to be racing only because he was from Vermont and he was a ski racer and he went to University of Colorado. Yeah, in Boulder, yeah. For, for ski racing, yeah, right? sure. Like, so... It's like, but that's the, uh, it's the opposite side. It's like people trying to take the piss out of the guy who was at the top a little bit, right? Yeah. Like, so it's skewed well, in Well, at the same way. time, right. you, Tom was calling snowboard ski boards. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, So yeah. it's like you, yeah, can, so you can- Who cares? Yeah, right, right, exactly. right, exactly. <laughs> and, and it was yeah. very adamant that they were going to be called ski boards. But it's so <laughs> satisfying when somebody says a statement like, Jake may have invented the snowboard, but Tom invented the snowboarder. Yeah, it's it, that it, feels good it, to it, say. It does feel, but it's not right. It's not. But I mean, it, it's like, <laughs> don't say anything about Jake. Tom invented the snowboarder. Yeah, <laughs> you no. know what I mean. Uh, yeah, I know. And you know what? All I know is without each of those people, without mm -hmm. the tension, without mm -hmm. the, you know, without my compete in in the Northwest, and without, you know. Chris and Bev Sanders in, in Tahoe and without Dimitri, of course, and without um, Stevie Dara on the East Coast, like snowboarding wouldn't be what it is right now. So you know what? Everybody contributed. Yes. <laughs> like how about yes. that? Yeah. You know what I mean? That's, and, and, that's way better. Yeah. And, and like who cares? Because everybody bit everybody and everybody still bites everybody. Like if it's a good idea, it's a great, you know, yeah. it's a good idea. And so take it and then improve upon it. And, right. and without that, you know, we'd still be writing these boards that we were looking at a lot of these things. I mean, it, there's you have to find a way to look at what other people do and let it inspire you, and then one up them, make it better. Yeah, and that's and that's where that's how snowboarding progressed so fast, so quick. Yeah. And then that went totally the other way, where skiing then was biting snowboarding. Like you know what I mean? And yeah, so totally. Who cares? You yeah, know, and yeah. I'm, I'm, and it's it's funny too. I mean, that whole thing of like skiing versus snowboarding and all all this stuff. Um, I'm just so I'm just personally so over all of it. Yeah, and so and and it, but it it has been. Those are the things that I've always tried to do. My whole, I mean, it's not really a career because it's just a, it's a thing I do and I love it. <laughs> but I, I've always tried to you know, try to break some of those barriers. You know, like this museum project was a big one. I mean, getting on the board of directors at SIA was, was a big one back then. Yes. Because then it really was sort of skiers versus snowboarders and the business and the whole thing. And then I tried to break down this barrier to get, you know, the Colorado Ski Museum to be the Colorado Ski and Snowboard Museum, which we finally got. And now it's the Colorado Snow Sports Museum. So oh, we're, cool. we we finally got it there. <laughs> you know what I mean? And and yeah. um and so and, and that's so that's what I've been kind of trying to do, even past those last brands that I worked on in in my sort of past few years of career. I've been trying to continue to to sort of break down some of those barriers, innovate, innovate, and, yeah. and break down some of the barriers, and and just and you know you maybe not unite that chasm so much but just not care about it right and just not pay attention to yeah, it yeah it does know? have the same kind of energy as racism or sexism <laughs> or whatever like it uh, it's just exclusionary for no for real no, reason no real reason yeah i mean i was not that stoked when the all the olympic free skier guys w had their 
<laughs> had their week at Mount Hood because they like way more woo on their jumps, <laughs> yeah. and it kind of like and and they're intimidating to be around because they're so fucking good. Yeah, you totally, know what I mean? Of course. But there was a mad respect there. Yeah. Like I'm watching these guys, and they look like snowboarders from the early '90s. Yeah. They're they're wearing baggy clothes. Their jackets are unzipped. They're they're being lazy. They're riding in trains that are way too close together. Very dangerous. Doing yeah. huge insane tricks. And I'm like. Those are the kids of the of now. Yeah. Those well, are, now you're fanning yeah. out a little too hard on skiing. <laughs> <laughs> <Just like, laughs> Got to call you out a little bit all here. All right, all right. I'm still not yeah. going to ski. Yeah. But no, I'm just kidding. I but, can't do <laughs> I, I still don't even slipboard more just because it's not enjoyable for me. It's it's too much work. Splitboarding? Yeah. Oh, see, that's my new yeah my new thing because traffic. So you're a skier, is what it comes down to. No wonder <laughs> only you're going up, dude. Skiers. Only going up. <laughs> no, no. Splitboarding has been like my second, yeah, like the second coming of snowboarding for me. Actually, quite honestly, because the like we were talking about this, like especially, you know, the, I can hit on Colorado for the traffic. I mean, every, any any ski area now, any whatever, everywhere, everywhere, it's everywhere. Of course, it's everywhere. Yeah. And so. From my house in Boulder, I can try to go like the Central Mountain. So everything that people know about is Colorado, you know, Breckenridge and Copper Mountain and Vail and Keystone and, you know, all Beaver Creek, all that stuff. Loveland, it's all central. Mm -hmm. It's all on I-70. I-70 is the one street to get there. Yeah. And everybody that's moved to Colorado in the last 40 years has moved here to go to ski areas. Yeah. So it's, it's a madness trying to get up there. We have the little ski area, Eldora, right? You know, 18 mile, and which I love, but now it's an icon past mountain. So you, you can't roll up there at nine anymore. You have to leave Boulder by seven. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's yeah, painful. So, so the splitboard thing has been from my doorstep. It can be like, if I wanted to go to Vail on a Saturday morning, I would have to leave at like 4.30 in the morning or five to get there at a reasonable hour to actually get some de some time in. Yeah. But I can, in less than an hour, be at Rocky Mountain National Park, going the other way with no traffic and just being out in the most amazing, like beautiful nature yeah. experience yeah. with untracked snow, with, you know, super mellow. They have crazy stuff, but low angle, safe. Yeah. Powder laps with friends. A lot of them are skiers. You know, it's just like my whole thing is... And I, again, I love going and doing, I still love all parts of snowboarding, but my, of the last few years, maybe in my old age, I've mellowed out a little bit, but I, I absolutely love not only splitboarding, but just even good snows, like around, like I was telling you, showing you some spots like around yeah, Boulder that yeah. I've ridden years and years and years. And I just found a new spot that I'm like, <laughs> dying for the snow Yeah, because we don't get that much snow in Boulder, but we get, you know, a foot five or six times a year. Red. And that'll, like, the spot I just found is in the shade, I think, all winter. Mm, nice. And I'm just like, I'm, and it's like right here. I'm so hyped. So, Red. Anyway, Red. Yeah. Like my, I'm, the whole just getting out there and doing it. I don't, I don't even care what most people would call like, oh, that's not, that's not even great. It's just like, well, yeah, you know what? I just got 40 powder turns. <laughs> yeah. And I could see my house. Yep. Like, okay, Absolutely. that's totally fine with me. Yeah. It's totally fine. And then it's, and it's full circle because it's the same place I learned to snowboard before. That's right. We were allowed to ride lifts and we had edges. So, yeah. 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 You know, the, the passion's still there and it, and it reignites it every year. It's so much fun. Oh, yeah. That's what it comes down it's, to. It's just insane yeah. fun. No, totally. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to hold off on the split board thing until uh, I'm not, I don't need it. Because I, I feel like we're going to have some drones soon. Some drones that we just like, Dude, you hang on. Flying cars, go, man. I, flying that's, cars. That's what I'm going to start go doing. Because yeah, I can't yeah. afford like, <laughs> you know, like a condo yeah. somewhere, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what, I've got this whole grab plan now that I'm just going to find like a little plot of land that has no access. There you go. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to put it like a concrete pad. Yep. And I'm going to just land my flying car. Yeah, so concrete pad, <laughs> solar panels that trickle charge like an array of batteries. Yeah, outhouse. And you just land your flying, you know, let's, let's dream big. It's <laughs> your flying Winnebago, right? <laughs> you get a flying, your flying camper van. Yeah down set it on the pad and oh, be there by yourself dude, and then I'm, there'll be a, a an auxiliary flying 
thing yeah. that you can sit on and get to the top, and then it'll follow Cameo the whole way down. Yeah. And then if you get in an avalanche, it'll it'll come down. It'll dig you out dig right you, away. Yeah. yeah, or it'll just pick you up before you. You can just have a yeah have a cord. Or yeah, something yeah. Zzz, like, yeah, yeah. I'm holding out for that stuff because the split boarding <laughs> thing's a lot of work. But you know what? It's really fun. <laughs> I, it's really strange. I, I'm not, and I'm so far from an athlete. Like I really sure. don't like working out. Yeah. But it's there's something just cathartic about it. Like it, you're it's, just you're it's just, faster than what I do. Like the guys. Yeah, because you're, you're just the guys that are split boarding are getting two laps for every one of my boot pack. Laps. Yeah, because you're just boot packing it. Yep. Or do you have like verts or something? Or you I just have verts? But where I go, I don't really need them. You just yeah, you just walk up in the other. It's just a, a yeah. Yeah, and and actually, I'm pivoting where I go. Yeah, I'm, I'm I got a sled last year, so I'm oh, gonna yeah. I'm gonna go quality over quantity this year. Yeah, because I I I got acclimatized to the to these new crowded resorts. Yeah, like where I I've thought about it last year where I'm going. Okay, look, I'm getting up at six o'clock. Yeah, to get at the parking lot at seven <laughs> of the place that's. Mm-hmm. 20 minutes, 20 minutes from my from house, house yeah. that doesn't open till nine. Yeah, exactly. And we're filling that time with the, you know, make a pot of coffee. And, yeah, of course. And goof around and telling jokes. And sometimes there's Bailey in the coffee. Now I'm a little bit drunk. And then we miss, <laughs> oops, we missed the start because <laughs> yeah. everybody's been stacking up for an hour and a half to wait for the lift to open. Oh my God. And yeah. then it's just trash. No, totally. So I was like, wait, why am I putting well, no, all that, this effort? Yeah, Sled's a, a great yeah. answer as well. Like, but, like Vail Pass... Um, Buffalo Pass, uh, Rabbit Ears. I mean, there's there's amazing sled access stuff yeah. here too, and we've yeah. been riding that for years and years as yeah, well. Yeah, I'm watching Chad and what Chad's doing. Yeah. Chad Otterstrom knows w- what's up. Oh well, Chad's yeah. I mean, he's got Fat Chad's Tavern and like all like <laughs> yeah. He's got the like right where that is. It he's splitting, you know. Oh yeah, he's splitting. But he he does it every day. Every single and day. And he's just like a machine. Ka-ching. Yeah. Just like he's machine up, machine yeah, down, machine yeah. up, machine down. It's amazing. He's, yeah. I mean, talk about somebody who's committed. 100% committed. <laughs> Chad, was thinking, yeah. That's it. Yeah. He's always, yeah, he posted all those pictures. I bought his book. He had a book of like a beautiful picture from every day in February. I didn't know he has a, I had no idea he has a book. Yeah. It's super sick. It's like a coffee table book. Oh, I'll hit it's him up. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. It's absolutely beautiful. I, I, I get, I run into him like, six or seven times a year just of down course. at events you know yep. we were just at a wedding yeah Raul from Satellite the, the local shop got, yep. got married and Brad had a super good time and like uh, they and it, those are fun because there's so many people that are from here so you you'll run into you know Pat A or like Brad or, yeah and like yeah. just just and we just every time just have those those reunion sort of events all the time. It's super good. Too fun, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for all the the work that you've done over the years on all the different brands and trying to document the history of snowboarding in a like I say a neutral way. It's, it's very refreshing, actually. Doing doing my best and just trying to again tell the tell the real story. Yeah. You yeah. know. I and mean. and <laughs> I was showing you like in the in the process now of. It, like it, it maybe it's my curse i don't know but launching a new brand yeah right and yeah. so it's and it's but it, it this time because it's just me um and of course i've got people it, that's not a really nice way to say it. i mean it was me who's who just started this i didn't start it with other people yeah i didn't start it with my brother i didn't start it and so it's like actually a, a, my first time to do just my ideas but it's actually really interesting too to be able to like look back at. I use all of this mm-hmm. as reference points. Yeah, and I look back and I look. I use Twist as a reference point. So again, it's like all of the people. Again, it's like supporting me, even if they're not working with me on a day to day basis. Like I'm making a magazine and I'm making all this stuff. And I'm like, wait, I did that. Or yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. Um. So it, it again, it, it's it, all of this again is just like my my whole point in everything I do is just to to find a way to maybe inspire people that they can actually go out and do it themselves, and then I just draw on it for my own inspiration and for the old, my own you know work I do super well. sick so, dude yeah so yeah. if anybody's ever in Colorado um, the museum's in Vail um, because the town of Vail gives the um, their they uh, basically donate the space rad um, because it's incredibly expensive and there's like staff and there's all and I it's all volunteer for me I don't yeah you know I lose money on it but that's okay because it's a passion um, but it is free 
for people to come in. Rad. Um, we have a, a, we just redid it um, two years ago, the entire museum, and have a really good timeline now, starting in the 30s and basically ending at the first Olympics. Epic. Um, as far as sort of how did snowboarding get to be what it is. Um, and then we have all these boards that I'm working on right now, this, this Tom Sims exhibit um, of, again, from the first idea to some of his last things that he did um, and and what was the, the thought process over a couple decades. Yeah, because you've gotten to talk to him about it. Oh, yeah. Oh, That's totally. incredible. Yeah, yeah, and luckily, and that was actually, and, and that'll be the last thing I say, I guess, is that um, now, of course, with Jake, um, it, it, it's more meaningful, but for with Tom we were able to to actually do the first museum launch and all of that just the a few months actually before he he passed away wow yeah and so it was like i didn't know it at the time that the work was actually important yeah it was just like it was fun and it's yeah. super fun rehashing old stories and hanging out with tom and doing all that stuff um and digging out these stories from him but who knew that some of that was the last time that i would see him oh, and man. be able to talk to him and and thank you know thank goodness we were able to sort of do that and document as much of it as we could. So yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Of course, that's you know, a great thanks, one. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Jake. This, thanks, yeah, thanks, thanks Jake. to everybody. Right. I, th- I think that's the point of this whole in- interview. It's like thanks to every yeah. single pioneer that put their heart and soul into it. Yeah. And you know, some some people went, won, some people lost, some people are still going and hoping oh, totally. to win. Yeah. Some people are, you know, completely left in obscurity it's totally right and and for me those people that maybe were more obscure or weren't at the time but now you know thanks chris pappas thanks dave dowd i mean those are the guys for me yeah that that made all the difference right Um, yeah just just personally um and so again this is just a chance to kind of give back yeah, that's super rad. Yep. Yeah, I could see a future where there's even more pieces, you know, like some, we'll get you some Kevin Young stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was really early in, influential oh, oh, stuff. Oh, totally, yeah. You know, some dev stuff. We like, just need some, we need more space. We just need, we need, <laughs> a, we need a, like a huge space. Yeah, well, and actually, and this is, if anybody's interested that's listening, yeah. um, you know, we do outreach stuff and we do, I, I'm always, having now gone through it for a long time, i um, happy to talk to anybody who's talking about trying to do something like this Yes, um, and the economics of it and how hard it is and how easy certain things are, whatever. Um, but also, um, really the next frontier for me, I think, is – and it's actually where this was going to start. Um, it's it's to do it all digitally and have a mm. like a digital repository of all this stuff yeah. and, and go out to people and, you know, hey, Chris Pappas, let's tell your story. Mm-hmm. And you can have as much space as you want. It's the internet. You can have as much space totally. as you want. You can put yeah. all the content. Yeah. Um. You know, just tell it. And and so that's I. I you know, I, I've had this thing that I've been working towards. Um, before I had an actual museum, and that was the thing it was going to be, and now it's the thing that I want it to be. Yeah. So that it doesn't. You don't have to physically walk through the door somewhere. Yep. Um. But it's something that you could actually, you know, people can draw from. And, and Talk to from. Jamie Mossberg. He's been yeah. thinking, yeah. parallel thinking on this for a long time. Cool. And and actually any person that I've talked to that sh- shoots on film yeah. that's got a box of, or 10 boxes of slides somewhere that they're afraid is going to get a thousand fire boxes. or oh, a yeah, totally. flood or sure. just wear out from, you know, just being old. Uh, Kevin Kinnear was talking about yep. his cassette tapes of, of his interviews. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, uh, there's all these interviews that yeah. could be digitized, but it's going to take a team of volunteers, you know, like it, a million it, monkeys working in a million it, it, typewriters. It, it, that's that's basically what time. it takes. And even yeah. then, it's still not free. There's so much. <laughs> and so, anyway. Yeah. Uh, so, anyway, if anybody wants to ever reach out, yeah. you, I'm easy to find. I'm, you can find me on LinkedIn or you can find me on. Yep. Instagram. Dope. It's just Trent, yeah. at Trent Bush. Like, yeah. <laughs> you can find me. It's pretty easy. Um, and so uh, I would very much appreciate anybody reaching out if they if they feel like they want to or if they ever want to ask questions about what we have in the museum or any specific thing. We, Some pretty cool we're, shit here. We're trying to be – we're just – we're really trying to be a resource and a resource of, of – as much of the truth as we possibly can yeah, glean yeah, out yeah, of it, yeah, everybody's mouth. So, yeah. Awesome. Sweet, dude. Thanks, Trent. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Later. Bye. Effin' Rad. Shoutouts this week to Trent Bush. Thanks for taking me through the Snow Sports archives. That was an all-time life event for me. 
holding Tom's 1965 homemade woodshop board and Craig's FE. There are no words. Special thanks to all you listeners out there who listen till the end. And be sure to come back next week for another episode of the Effenrad Snowboard Podcast presented by Vans and brought to you by SIA Productions.